welcome back. And now we're going to talk about some of the different types of samples that, that you can use. And uh, we're going we're gonna to break these into two groups. We're going to talk about probability samples and we're going to talk about non-probability samples. And I have been referring to these in the previous lectures, but here's where we're going to learn what, what really separates them. And again, these are really important terms. I mean, if you learn anything from this series, you need to understand population, sample, sample frame, probability sample and non-probability sample. Those are probably the five most important terms that we're covering. So, what's a probability sample? Well, probability samples are really the ideal sample that we're going to draw in any sort of research. And um, their key attributes, their hallmarks as I put them, uh, really involve randomness, which is um, making sure that sample units are selected through some random means for inclusion in the in sample, an equal probability of being selected, and then projectability, um, that because we have randomness and equal probability being selected, that we can project the findings to the population as a whole. So the, the samples involve ensuring that every sample unit has an equal chance of being selected in the sample. That's what a probability-based sample is all about. Let's compare that to a non-probability sample. Non-probability samples um, have an, a more arbitrary selection process where the researcher decides um, who can or can't participate. You know, it's like when we were talking about uh, collecting measurements at the muck. You know, a researcher could just say, hey, you, get over here, participate in the study. That's an arbitrary selection process. Um, there is a tendency towards bias in non-probability samples. Um, a lot of times the people that participate in non-probability samples are volunteers. Um, they might express very positive or very negative points of view. Um, and we can't assume any degree of representation because we don't know if um, the sample's representative or not. And in fact, it even allows, um, like let's say that we're doing a BMI study at the MUC where we're measuring BMI and there's a group on campus that's very politically active against um, research that suggests that students are getting fatter. And so they send as many skinny students in as they can to crush the results, to make sure that the results skew towards people being skinny. Um, why they would want to do such a thing, I don't know, but it is possible in a non-probability sample and it is a, a problem that we have to definitely concern ourselves with. And that means that our results can't be projected. We can only talk about the results in, in a sample level me matter only. We cannot project them to the population at large. Now, does that mean that they're worthless? No. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that we have drawn the most convenient samples uh, sample units from the population and that we're going to have um, sometimes what we call pseudo representation but we're not going to have real representation and so we just have to be aware one of the big limitations of a non-probability study is that we can't use it to describe anything other than the people that were included in that study we cannot project the findings so now let's talk about a few different types of probability samples there are four basic categories that we're going to talk about. Um, and again, remember that definition. These samples involve ensuring that every sample unit has an equal chance of being selected for the sample. That's really important. So first we have a simple random sample. And, and by the way, if you look in your lecture notes on pages 7 and 8, uh, there are charts that talk about um, the um, types of probability and non-probability samples in a lot more detail, uh, a lot more written detail than the slides do here. So first of all, we have a simple random sample, and a simple random sample is, is exactly what it sounds like. You have a sample frame list um, where you're drawing all of your um, p potential sample units from, and what you do is you just draw a random group from that sample frame, and then you use that for your study. It's useful in situations where there's a broad sample that um, uh, you know you, you you can draw, and uh, there's no concerns about participation or representation of different groups like for example you're not worried that like more women are going to participate than men or older people are going to be more likely to participate than younger people or things like that so you just get a nice broad swath um, and it used to be pretty difficult to do a simple random sample but since we have computers now eh, it's pretty easy to do you can just uh, assign random numbers to everybody and then um, f sort by your random numbers and then just take some group of whatever size you need from that list so you know, for example, if I needed 500 people out of a list of 10,000, uh, I might assign everybody, everybody in that group um, a, uh, a random number and then just take everybody that 
fell in, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the top 500 once I sorted by those random numbers. So it's very easy to do. Um, another form of a probability sample is called a systematic sample. And a systematic sample was a lot more useful back when we didn't use computers to draw samples. What you would do is instead of um, assigning everybody a random number and then sorting and then trying to, to, to figure out who participated in your sample, what you could do instead is you could say, okay, I'm going to start at a random spot in the list and I'm going to go by an interval. I'm going to, like every third person I'm going to include in the sample. So I'll start at a random point so that I have my randomness and then I'm just going to take every third person and uh, I'm going to continue on until I have my quota filled up for however many people I want to include in the sample. And, you know, it's not a bad method. Um, there are a couple of limitations with that method. One is that um, it, it's possible that maybe the list that you have um, there's something going on in that list that is causing every third person to be uh, less representative <laughs> when they're chosen. So, you know, for example, let's say that you have a list uh, where it's sorted freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. So every, every fourth entry you flip back to freshman and you're picking every third person on that list. And uh, you, so you, the, the, pers the interval where you start is at junior and then you're going to pick every third person. Well, or, or let's say every fourth person, excuse me, every fourth person. Um, so we have four categories, and you're going to start at junior, and you're going to pick every fourth person. So you're going to get all juniors in your sample, and you're not going to get uh, any freshmen, sophomores, or seniors. And that can be bad. Now, why your list would be sorted that way, I'm not sure, but it's one of the things you have to be careful about. And, of course, one of the best ways to make sure that it doesn't happen is to ensure that your list isn't sorted in such a way that any of those effects are going to happen. Um, consider, like spring, summer, fall, and winter, you know, again, you know, you have, you could have seasonal effects that are really important to account for in your sample, and you pick every, it's sorted spring, summer, fall, winter, and then you pick every fourth category, you're in trouble. You might get all of one season and not anything else. So, you have to be careful with interval sampling. The other problem with it is that it's just, it, it, because of the potential for it, and because it's so easy to do a random sample now, it's just not necessary. So um, it's not really a recommended uh, way of doing things. It used to be when we did everything on paper, but I wouldn't recommend it today. Stratified samples are a, a third option, and they are used pretty commonly. Um, stratified samples are used when you are concerned that um, there's going to be some kind of skewness or bias to your list just based on representation. So again, uh, I said, you know, what if we were concerned that women were going to be more likely to participate in a survey than men? We were, we were concerned that the population has 50% women and 50% men, but that 70% of women, or 70% of the list is, uh, that participates is going to be women and only 30% is going to be men. And we, we think that because that's what historical data have shown us. So what we might do is we might say, okay, well, we need a total sample of 500, and it's a 50-50 split between men and women, so we're going to interview... 250 women and 250 men. We're going to split the sample into two pieces and we're going to take a random sample from each of those two pieces. And that's a stratified sample. That's what it's all about. It's just about taking the sample, splitting it uh, by some grouping variable, gender, uh, age, or age categories, usually not usually just age, but age categories, maybe zip codes, um, you know, things like that. And then um, ensuring that each subset of your sample is proportionally sampled. So, you know, if you have, let's say, if, if in your population you have, um, uh, let's say, um, most of the people in your population, let's say 70% of the people in your population are going to be young and 30% are going to be old, then you wouldn't do a 50-50 split in your sample. You wouldn't interview 50% young and 50% old. You would do a proportional sample. You would say, okay, 70% of the 500 people we need are going to be in the young group, and 30% of the, the people we need are going to be in the old group. So you would make sure that it's proportional. But then within each of those groups, with, within the young group and within the old group, you're going you're to take a random sample. And that randomness is what makes a stratified sample work is you're just setting the proportions based on your population statistics or your historical data and you're ensuring that um, the, the sample that you get it continues to be representative of the, of the population as a whole. And that's why you would use a stratified sample. Um, I would suggest that it's better to 
go with a, ran a simple random sample unless you know that you need a stratified random sample. But if you're going to use a stratified sample, make sure you're basing your, the, your strata on actual statistics and not just on what you think, because otherwise you're going to really throw things off. The final group is called a cluster sample. Now, students often get stratified and cluster samples mixed up. Uh, I'm going to tell you that cluster samples are not used that often in marketing research, and, and I'll explain why here. Because what you're going to do in a cluster sample um, is you're going to take your population and you're going to you're going to break it into chunks. So think about like taking a loaf of, of Italian bread and cutting it into slices. Okay, and then what you're going to do is you're going to eat a few of those slices and you're going to ignore the rest of the bread. But you're going to eat those slices in their entirety and you're just going to ignore the rest of the bread. And then you're going to you're going to say that you had a whole loaf of bread. That's what a cluster sample is in essence. You're going to take your population, you're going to split it into a bunch of pieces, and then you're going to, uh, and, and those pieces are going to be groups of, of, of people that are in your sample frame. And then you're going to interview everybody within each of those pieces and you're going to ignore the rest. But you're going to select those pieces randomly so that there is randomness to what you're doing. You're just, you're, you're only going to interview people that are within those chosen pieces and you're going to interview everybody. So um, let, me, let me explain this in a, in a more realistic fashion. Let's say that you're going to do a survey in the St. Louis area and you know there are hundreds of zip codes in the St. Louis area. You have a list of everybody that lives in those zip codes. What you're going to do is you're going to randomly select 30 of those zip codes. And in those zip codes, you're going to interview every single person. So you're going to take a census in every one of those 30 zip codes that you've collected. But you're going to ignore all of the other hundreds of zip codes that exist in St. Louis. And then you're going to say that because you randomly selected those zip codes, that they are representative of the St. Louis area in general. And because you interviewed every single person within that zip code, that uh, you have complete data. Here's the problem with clustering. It's really hard to do. Um, how do you get everybody in a zip code to participate in a study unless you're the US government or some agency that has an ability to do that. It's really tr really tough. And how do you um, split things up in a way that you're absolutely certain you can trust the results? It, 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 it's very tricky. So I'm not suggesting you shouldn't use a clustering technique. I'm just saying in marketing research, I don't think I've seen it done very often. Um, most of the time, simple random samples and stratified samples are the way to go because a simple random sample just makes sense. It's really easy to do. And a stratified sample is essentially a simple random sample with the added uh, bonus of saying, hey, we're going to take one, these one or two groupings and we're going to make sure that they're represented. And so we're going to split the random sample into a few pieces and make sure that we randomly sample those few pieces and then put it all back together. A cluster sample, on the other hand, like I said, it's like having a whole loaf of bread taking out a few slices randomly, eating those, and then saying you ate the whole loaf of bread. It just, it's, it's, uh, for marketing research, it's a little bit difficult to wrap your head around. So with that said, now let's talk about some non-probability techniques. So I'm going to tell you about four different types of non-probability samples. And with, with non-probability samples, the, the, the most common of them is called a convenient sample. Now remember, Non-probability samples mean that we, we're going to take the most convenient sample units from the population. Sometimes we're going to have pseudo-representation, but pseudo-representation means it's going to appear to be representative, but it's not necessarily going to be representative. So um, we often, in, in the research field, um, just call a non-probability sample a convenience sample because that's what it is. It's just drawing uh, people that are convenient to participate in your study and not really worrying about whether they're representative or not. There are times where that's okay to do. There are times where we need that. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on those at the end of this lecture series, but that's what a convenient sample is. <clears throat> uh, purposive sampling, also known as judgment sampling, um, purposive, you know, it means uh, with purpose. That, that's the idea. We're, purposive sampling is where we're going to take uh, people that the researcher, the research team judges are best qualified to participate in the survey. So it's still a convenience sample, but we're gonna we're gonna pick them based on some criteria or qualification that uh, we might not have in a, a straight up convenience sample. And you're gonna use it a lot in business to business research. You're gonna use it a lot in situations where you have really small populations, uh, maybe like expert users or group you know groups like that, where um, 
you're, you're not going to be able to draw a random sample easily, and even if you were, you're not, you don't necessarily need to. Um, so I would say purposive sampling is used a lot in qualitative research, for example. Um, it could be used a lot for expert interviewing. It could be a lot, used a lot for business-to-business -business research. It's um, not a bad way to do things, provided that you understand the limitations of what it can do. But um, you are making a judgment based on your experience and your knowledge about who should be in your sample, and that does have some limitations that come with it. There's also a referral sample. Now, a referral sample is like a convenience sample. Um, but what you do is, after people participate in your study, you invite them to refer friends or family or colleagues or whoever to also participate. It's all, sometimes also known as a snowball sample. You know, like the idea is you start off with a small snowball and you roll it down the hill and it begins to build and build and build. That's a referral sample. Um, great for a hard to reach cohort group. Great for, um, you know, if, if you're just trying to get a lot of people to participate and you don't want to have to do a lot of work to get them to, to, to participate, you guys are going to basically be using a referral sample, by the way, for your um, uh, class projects that you're doing for this course. Um, so referral samples are useful. Um, they just, they have the same problems as convenient samples. You, they don't have any kind of uh, ability to diagnose representation. Uh, you don't know why people are participating in the study. And... Um, you have even less control of who participates since you're not even making the call about who gets in. You're allowing the respondents to make a call about who gets in. The final non-probability sample we'll talk about is a quota sample. Now, a quota sample is where you say, okay, I'm going to take a convenience sample, but I'm going to set some guidelines, darn it. I'm going to make sure that the people that participate in this study fit the criteria that I'm looking for. So, um, you know what? I'm going to make sure that, after, or, that we're going to do 500 interviews we're going to have a 50-50 split of men and women. That's the way it's going to be. And it's a convenient sample. There's not, they're not being selected through a random process, but I'm going to cut off when we get to 250 women and make sure that we get 250 men as well. That's a quota sample. It approximates the representation that you might have in a probability sample, but it's using a convenient sample uh, in a way that um, the researcher is just placing some guidelines or some rules on what kind of data he or she wants to get in. So, if you were to ask me, Sean, uh, which one should you use? I would say if your goal is projectability, comparison, or limiting the potential for bias, probability samples are the way to go. And I would say that they are the ideal. If you can do a probability study, you should do a probability study. They are a little bit more expensive and can be more time consuming, but they're worth the effort. They get you much better data, um, much, much more useful data over time. But if your goal is saving money, collecting quick, basic data, or if you're dealing with a small, highly qualified population where random sampling is too difficult, like business to business, or a hard to reach group, or um, you know, executives, or uh, physicians, or um, you know, maybe uh, uh, experts, you know, people like that, non-probability samples are a good way to go. They're also great for qualitative research. They're also great for small surveys where the purpose is really just to kind of get a read on the, the, the temperature of something before you dip your toe in all the way. I mean, you know, they can be used for uh, those kind of applications. It's just remember, with a non-probability sample, you're limited to what that sample has to say. You can't project your findings. You can't say that they mean anything beyond what that sample had to say. And that's the biggest problem with them.